So concept four, um, discuss and compare the values of the first generation congregationalists with those of the second generation, collectively all generations after the first, basically, and explain how the American environment um, complemented these new values and formed a foundation for um, our present day values, which is basically, we're basically summarizing the, 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 what we've looked at um, in uh, the preceding concepts for this lecture and seeing the relevance of it. Why is this important? Why do we still hear about Puritans and the Puritan work ethic um, and whatnot? All right, so basically just recapping, basically the first generation, um, the, pro the differences between the two. So for the first generation religion, there was uh, virtually no religious tolerance in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, most Congregationalist leaders uh, feared the unsettling consequences of religious enthusiasm, such as occurred in the 1630s with Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. In Europe, as in early Massachusetts, people were very dogmatic about their religious beliefs and the ideas um, that there was room for more than one opinion or any important question seemed foolish to them. There was only one true and godly answer to any question, and it would be a, a sin to tolerate any point of view or mode of behavior that was not in God's way. To tolerate a different religious view was to undermine the works of God and to un as they understood them. This was looked upon as a threat to the social order. So a very intolerant society, the first generation of Congregationalists, Puritans. Uh, government. There was no democratic government in the early years of Massachusetts, and the visible saints of the colony had no interest in creating any or protecting individual freedoms. To John Winthrop, who served as governor or deputy governor of the colony for 19 years, democracy was the, quote, meanest and worst, unquote, of all forms of government. According to one clergyman, quote, if the people be governors, who shall be governed, unquote. During the voting in, in town meetings in the church, Congregationalists did not practice majority rule, but argued and sweated their way toward a consensus. The objective of the um, migration in 1630 had been to establish a religious experiment in order to create a desired lifestyle. Thus, the lifestyle had to be protected by the most careful regulation of the details of life. So, in order to preserve class restrictions, a Massachusetts law in 1651 uh, regulated dress code, for instance. Quote, No person whose estate shall not exceed the value of 200 pounds shall wear any gold or silver lace upon the penalty of 10 shillings. The selectmen of every town in he uh, are hereby required to take notice of apparel in any of the inhabitants and whosoever they shall judge to exceed their ranks in uh, costliness and fashion of their apparel, the, the selectmen shall have uh, power to assess, end quote. All right, so um, talking about how people should dress and who should uh, dress that way um, within the, the beginning, the first generation of, of this uh, community. In the towns, there were numerous sets of rules um, and requirements for church attendance, uh, fence maintenance, and management of livestock, the number of days that men had to work on public roads, bridges, and dams, blasphemy, or any contemptuous or profane acts such as uh, Sabbath breaking and adultery were viewed not only as sins, but as crimes. So, uh, to the stocks for not going to church, and uh, to death for cheating on your on your wife. Perpetuators were fierce, uh, were definitely persecuted. In order to carry out this objective, the saints uh, made certain that power stayed in the hands of the first generation godly minority. Uh, when the Congregationalists first arrived, about 1% of the population were freemen with the privileges of voting, but in a few months uh, popular uh, pressure compelled Winthrop to enlarge their number. Not until 1634 um, did Winthrop concede the freemen their right to elect uh, colonial officials annually, a right guaranteed by uh, company charter. 
and by 1644, the general court, the legislative body of the colony, was composed of an upper uh, chamber of assistants and a lower chamber of deputies, two from each town. Despite this representative machinery, the magistrates and ministers maintained their power by requiring that a man actually be a church member in order to exercise the right to vote. Uh, economy in the first generation. Uh, there was an anti-capitalist environment and philosophy in early Massachusetts, uh, ironically enough, that deemed individual profit and desires for uh, the highest profit to be sinful. This was viewed as uh, having a greater concern for oneself than one's community. Any sort of self-seeking ambition or individualism was a betrayal of the spiritual welfare of the community. Hence, there was a no laissez-faire economy since the saints wanted to control the economic development of the, uh, of the colony for the good of the religious experiment. By passing such laws as was necessary, they even um, set the price of labor um, might charge for um, his service. So, second generation, uh, religion. As already discussed, religious tolerance gradually developed for the second generation. Congregationalists started with uh, the Halfway Covenant of 1662. This continued until the 1690s when the Halfway Covenant uh, gradually developed into Covenant of Works, just being a nice person. Um, also, as mentioned, the English Crown had attempted to take some of the bite out of the religious bark when it repealed the colony's charter in 1684 and issued a new one in 1691. Uh, allowing everybody to vote, not just church members. Uh, religious tolerance carried with it important political consequences and had significant impact on the colony. With the religious tolerance came political liberalism and a more democratic society. Government. Again, as discussed, starting in the early years of the colony's development, there was no representative government, nor a desire by the visible saints to create one. However, as a result of the changing economic and religious conditions within the colony, there was a liberalizing of the voting requirements. The following um, six points um, chronologically demonstrate this liberalization. So in 1630, um, the number of freemen eligible to vote was 12. 12 people. By 1631, the number was increased to 130 after some political pressure was brought to bear. Uh, by 1634, Governor Winthrop conceded the freemen their right to elect colonial officials annually and thus establish a representative form of government. This occurred when each town received uh, the right to elect two deputies who uh, could advise the general court. However, the deputies could only initiate legislation. They could not vote on it until 1644, when the House of Deputies became a formal branch of the general court. By 1644, the population of the colony was about 15,000 people, with um, 1,708 eligible to hold um, office to vote. Out of the population of 15,000, um, it is estimated that there were only 3,750 males of voting age, um, over 16, which means by 1644, one in every two adult males held the franchise to vote. Um, this was a higher percentage than in England, and uh, um, for that matter, anywhere else in Europe. Right? So democracy is expanding um, by the second generation um, in, in this New England colony. In 1664, two years after the passage of the halfway covenant, the right to vote was extended to all halfway members. And in 1691, the new charter, which made Massachusetts a royal colony, also gave voting privileges to all qualified male property holders. Thus, democracy seeped into Massachusetts Bay Colony, although unwanted by the visible saints. Uh, the economy, as congregationalists failed in trying to recreate the proper environment in order for their people to live at a spiritual level by having uh, experienced conversion, they intellectualized the symptoms of the religion to the point where they lost the spiritual feeling, right? They were thinking about it too much, in other words. Um, this can be exemplified by um, comparing the change 
in the nature of grace between the first and uh, second generation. Congregationalists. Um, the sign of God's grace um, prosperity for the first generation Congregationalists came in time to seem more important than um, the grace itself to the second generation. Money is power. Um, this is a quote. Um, Every good man and woman ought to strive for power. To do good um, with it when obtained, tens of thousands of men and women get rich honestly. But they are often accused by an envious lazy crowd of unsuccessful persons of being dishonest and oppressive. I say get rich, but get, but get money honestly or it will be uh, a withering curse." Unquote. The transformation which uh, took place uh, between the first and second generation Congregationalist Puritans explains the confusion of ethics uh, problems which many people face when studying the nature of the Puritan character. This also explains why American legends praise the Puritan fathers for contributions such as religious liberalism, um, democracy in government, and laissez-faire economy which are not justly deserved uh, in many respects. Um, it is, it is uh, necessary to keep in mind that one of the important reasons for this transformation was because of the influence of the American environment uh, as it uh, uh, interacted with the principles of the, uh, the Congregationalist uh, religion. The elements of the American environment, its harshness as well as its abundance of land reinforce the worth of the individual against communal um, ideology of the Congressionalist Puritans in Massachusetts. This combination of events created what some uh, called uh, a, um, the deadness of soul, as the second generation failed to develop a spiritual level that was uh, comparable to the first. Um, by the mid um, 1800s, second um, generation congregations' values had become a part of the American value system, as demonstrated by the following quotes. Uh, Pastor Henry Ward Beecher said, quote, God has intended the great to be great and the little to be little. Poverty was evidence of sinfulness. Um, the poor had um, only themselves to blame, unquote. The Gospel of Wealth Theory, developed by Andrew Carnegie in the 1870s, was a quasi-religious principle that held that the uh, acquisition of wealth was a mark of divine favor, and that the rich, therefore, had a moral responsibility both to get richer and to direct the affairs of society. All right, so that concludes concept uh, four um, and the, the lecture series on salutary neglect um, puritism and uh, New England. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, email me or we'll t talk to each other in class. Uh, go forth and be great and um, begin to transcribe your notes into essay form. Excellent. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.